फैलाएंगे सदाकते इस्लाम कुछ भी हो जाएंगे हम जहाँ भी के जाना पड़े जाएंगे हम जहाँ बेके जाना पड़े हमें अस्सलाम वालेकुम पीस बी अपॉन यू एंड वेलकम टू दिस न्यू सीरीज ऑफ बीकन ऑफ ट्रूथ द पर्पस ऑफ दिस प्रोग्राम इज टू एक्सप्लोर वेरियस कंटेम्प्रेरी इश्यूज इन पर्टिकुलर दोज that are relevant to young muslims in this day and age to help understand these the various subjects we will be relying upon the expertise of our guests as well as looking at the views of the general public so today's subject is something that has agitated the minds of mankind from the very beginning of time it can be a difficult concept to understand yet the vast majority of people do accept it i am of course talking about the subject of the existence of god so our guests in the studio today are ayaz mahmood khan sahib on my left and uh, zafar malik sahib uh, also both of whom are the scholars and imams of the amdia muslim community and if you would like to get in touch uh, you can do so via twitter and email the contact details should be on screen for you uh, at this point uh, right now so let's um, get straight into it uh, gentlemen let's talk about atheism what is atheism is it what exactly do they believe is it a set of beliefs or is it just a way of life so if i could ask you to it's a very topical question as you mentioned as pansav and especially given the fact that if you study the all the research polls given in the last few decades we see that a rising trend especially in the west in the fact that atheism is you can't deny it's on the rise um whether people are leaving organized religion or they just don't believe in god or they just don't ascribe to anything so that in itself is on the rise so atheism if you want the textbook answer is the fact there's a lack of belief in god or got multiple gods but if we in the world today we meet different types of atheists and um on the one hand there'll be some who say that um there is absolutely no evidence for the existence of god and these are in the minority then there are some atheists who say that there is no evidence or we don't see any evidence for the existence of god and therefore we don't see the reason to believe in god some of the prominent atheists in the world these days we we know richard dawkins is one and the reason why i mention him is because he fluctuates from one to the other from one category to the other in the sense that initially his stance was that he would say that i don't see any evidence for the existence of god and science is everything but then again recently in a in an interview um someone asked him that what would it take for you to believe in god and he said and initially he said that i thought it would have been the second coming of jesus or you know a booming voice from the skies so then the question asked again what would it take and he said well now i think nothing really and that that's that's a direct quote so what i mean to say is that these sorts of trends are uh, on the rise and it's not just the fact that they don't believe in god in fact they're opposed to organized religion as well and they've made that their manifesto to attack organized religion and of course in this day and age as we know that islam on the other hand is on the rise and islam you know people ascribing to islam is increasing so as you can say that the two heavyweights in this division are up there in in the sense of islam and atheism Zafar Sahib was talking about um organized religion and how atheism or people who are very strong proponents of atheism they say that um organized religion is the result of all of the conflict that we see in the world today so um since religion is responsible for that and religion is an offshoot of god therefore we neither believe in god and we neither believe in religion either but and and I've often heard that atheists will almost attack if you will uh, religious people and say that they're staunch believers of things which have no evidence 
and they hold by their view and they don't change their opinion um, even if evidence is presented. But you asked about religion as well. The thing is, atheism, although it's not called a religion, but it's no different. If, if atheists raise the objection against people who believe in God, that they are rigid and they hold to their views, and that is a sign of organized religion, well then a religious person can say the same thing about people who are atheists. And you just gave the example of Richard Dawkins where they've already decided that they're not going to change their mind. And it's probably going to take um, someone coming down physically and revealing themselves in, f for them to believe. Um, but God doesn't walk down to earth in the form of a person and walk around and introduce himself to people. There's other ways that we learn about God. So if we're just going to talk about, I mean, religion is m merely a way of life. It's a path. It's a course that someone takes in life. Um, and that can be one of belief and it can be one of unbelief. I think the real important thing to remember is that whether it's belief in God or non-belief in God, a closed-minded, rigid attitude towards any philosophy in life is always a, a detrimental thing and it always prevents us from learning new things. So uh, I would say to people who are atheists that they need to ask themselves this question whether they've really exhausted all of the avenues for research into God and if they haven't then they should and as far as religious people are concerned if, if we speak about ourselves I'm sure we can say that we believe in God because we have evidence that He exists and we have experienced God and we've gone on this journey to experience God. So I think on both sides, um, whether it's talking about belief or non-belief, we have to make sure that we believe in the things we believe, not because of a preconceived prejudice, but because we genuinely believe that based on evidence and through reflection and contemplation. Uh, just for the benefit of the viewers at home, you can tweet in your views uh, to us and uh, we will hopefully, uh, if possible, we will uh, uh, read those out as well. Um, so let's just talk about the existence of God then. Does God exist? And how can we be certain that God exists? Well, I mean, there's lots of ways that we can find proof for the existence of God. Often when we talk about God's existence, there's various logical and philosophical arguments um, which are presented um, by religious people. Like, for example, they will speak about the, the argument from causation and say that it, logically it, there must be a main cause which results in other things. In effect, always comes about from a cause. And that prime cause is God Almighty. Um, therefore, th that's one argument. Another argument is the, this concept of intelligent design, that the, the workings of the universe and the structure that we see in the universe is so perfect that it, it can only have occurred, it can only exist and be sustained if there is a intelligent being who takes care of those affairs and that being is God. Then we have the cosmological argument, the ontological argument, all of these philosophical arguments which, which I guess could take a person to the level of that there ought to be a God, that maybe there is a God. But these arguments, these philosophical arguments, these logical arguments aren't conclusive proof of the existence of God. And the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, the Promised Messiah, has mentioned that. He says these are arguments which show that there should be a God or which could le lead a person to the stage where they feel that it's plausible that God exists or some higher being exists. But the real e conclusive proof for the existence of God is revelation and prophecy, to have a personal relationship with God, for Him to speak to you and answer your prayers. And There's a number of allegations that many um, non, people who don't believe in, in the existence of God, they make this allegation that God did not create us, but it is rather something that we have created. It's more or less a figment of our imagination, as it were. Um, how would we look at that and what would we say? It's a very, um, so once, uh, as I mentioned, it's a very Freudian concept in the fact that uh, Sigmund Freud mentioned this as well in his Oedipus complex, the fact that when man, uh, he, he's a long and, uh, um, you know, a very um, uh, interesting philosophy of his, but in fact, the crux of it is that man and the bond between a father and a son is a connection. And eventually when the son grows up, moves out of the shadow of the father, he has that, a void. And to fill that void, you know, mankind has made this concept of God. But the fact is that 
if mankind has invented God, then the whole purpose of uh, prophets, the whole nature of revelation wouldn't work. And what I mean by that is that as an Ahmadi and believer of the promised Messiah of the latter days, we as a community know firsthand that God does exist. And it's not a figment of our imagination. In fact, it's proven from time immemorial when God Almighty sent prophets with the same message that there is uh, a God. And to this day, even if you ask even the general Muslim public that whether you, know, you can communicate with God or not, to this day, Christians, other Muslims will say, mm, maybe, or you know, it's difficult to you know, form a connection with God. He doesn't speak anymore, etc., etc., etc. But as Ahmadi Muslims, we know for a fact that God spoke before, just as he does today. And that's why the Promised Messiah was sent to form that connection between man and God once again. So to answer your question, if man created God in his own imagination, then I ask, why is it that a man in the desert who was illiterate and um, not, in a power, not in a status of power, he didn't have any influence in that time, he brought about a magnificent revolution in the fact that the Bedouins of you know, those people who were living like bandits almost were transfer, trans, you know, formed into people who were at the highest peak of moral excellence. And that revolution exists to this day. Because when we present this, people often say, oh, but there were other great political leaders in the world. You know, many people did great things. You know, Alexander the Great conquered a lot of the world. But my question is that to this day, who aspires to become like Alexander the Great? Or who aspires to become like Napoleon, etc.? And Alexander the Great never made any claims exactly. either. Mm. But you have this one man in, who's outnumbered. He has a small community of maybe a thousand followers, if yeah. that, uh, half of whom are slaves and uh, from the weaker aspects, of, sectors of society. And he says that Allah is going to help me and I'm going to triumph over all of you. And my message is going to spread to the ends of the earth and you can try and murder me, you can try and execute me, you can try and persecute my followers and do whatever you will, but God will make me victorious. And then that happens. Exactly. So there's a huge difference between those prophets who are outnumbered and who make these claims and then their claims are proven true because they have something in the back, in their back that backs them. And you can either accept that that's God or there, there's something really interesting that someone said that for someone to make a prophecy, for example, a man who doesn't have knowledge of things which are beyond, which are beyond the mental scope of him at that time. There are certain available pieces of data which you can collect and then make a conclusion based on that. But let's say a man who lives in the desert, he's, prophesied, prof, he's making prophecies about things 1400 years later and those things actually happen and we see that those things took place and are taking place. That person said that either you should accept that there was a God who gave him that information or either accept that that man is God because how can a normal person make these claims and then for them to be fulfilled? Exactly. There's so many in the Quran, Sab, like for example, the fact that the universe is expanding. Yeah. I mean, this is a concept that we find in the 20th century that was discovered when Edwin Hubble you know, discovered the fact that light from other galaxies would shift towards the red end of the spectrum. They discovered the fact that the universe is in fact expanding. Now, the Quran clearly states this, that we are the creators of this heavens and we make them expand constantly. So the fact is that these... An you know, illiterate man who didn't exactly. know how to read and write. Even write his own said, name, in fact. He couldn't even write his own name, but he says that Allah has revealed these words to me. And even Western Orientalists accept that the Holy Quran is a book which is preserved in the original language from 1400 years to now. And today we have that book, and it says in that book, in Arabic, that we have created the universe and it, we make it go on expanding. And that's proven through scientific... Uh, evidence now, how can these things be chance? So, so it's basically the, looking at the probability of uh, these things occurring, mm. it, you know, it suggests that there ought to be a God. Is that what you're saying? It leads you to, if you look at science, it can only lead you or the, the perfectness of this world. Uh, the fact that, you know, everything is, even in the galaxy, is fine-tuned to the, you know, the minutest of details. And in fact, for example, if the, if the cosmological tangent is uh, fine-tuned to approximately 120 decimal places. And if it was even one decimal place less 
the universe would have collapsed mm. on itself a long, long time ago. So the fact is, all of these uh, arguments, as Ayar Sub also mentioned, all the cause and effect argument, all these arguments lead you to the point where you think that there should be a creator. And this is what the Promised Messiah mentioned as well. But the fact that will take you to that one step further and enable you to realize that there is a creator, that's communion with God and revelation. Okay. And we see that in the life of the Promised Messiah throughout. I mean, a whole book is compiled of his revelations. And some of them are extraordinary. For example, I'll just mention one, um, the bubonic plague that was struck you know, in the late uh, 19th century, towards the end of the 1800s. In 1898, the Promised Messiah saw in a dream that he sees people planting you know, really horrific uh, looking trees, which are black in color. And when he asks, I'm just par paraphrasing the revelation, when he asks, what are these trees? He says, the, the people respond that these are the, the trees of plague, which will burst in the Punjab and overtake the whole country. So this is a revelation that the Promised Messiah immediately uh, published. Now, someone may say that we know from historical evidence that the, the plague actually was reaching India at that time anyway, because it had started in you know, somewhere along near China and it was moving its way down as the plague spreads anyway. But the fact is that something even more incredible happened afterwards. In 1902, God Almighty told the Promised Messiah Islam, there was a revelation that Inni uhafizu kullu man fiddar, kullu man fiddar, that I will protect every single person who is in your in your household, not just physical household, but your spiritual household. Now, for the fact that in this time period, four or five years, not a single Ahmadi or a single person who ascribes or followers, follows the Promised Messiah so is, uh, passes away due to the plague, it's quite an incredible uh, feat, especially if we know that the plague does not, it, it, it attacks at random. You know, the, the plague doesn't have a mind of its own that oh, I'll target all the, you know, people who are non Ahmadis, for example. It, and even if it did, that would be a proof of the existence it, of God too. Exactly, that would be <laughs> another proof. So these are just, that's just one prophecy that I've mentioned out of several hundred. And remember, at the time, the opponents of the Promised Messiah were looking for even the smallest amount, smallest bit of ammunition that they could use against him. So this is but just one of the... Key. That, that point is key, that for an individual to make a prophecy which is beyond the available data which is present in front of him to the extent that someone could say that this person has deduced certain events to make a prophecy, for someone to make a prophecy which is above and beyond that to the extent that we have to admit that only a higher being gave him that information and then he publishes that in advance, that's huge proof so of the So revelation is a key uh, method of deducing and, and ascertaining the cer or with certainty uh, that there is a, a living God. So now I think, it's, I think it's fair to say that it is quite natural for people to question the existence of God. I think it's naturally people want to know and therefore they, they have the, this battle going on in the minds with various rational arguments that they, they go through. Um, you know, it's normally argued that, you know, the educated elite and scientists are the type who don't believe in God. Why do you think that really is? I think that I would disagree with that um, because the fact of the matter is that there are many people who held, uh, adhered to a religious belief, who were uh, devout uh, people who followed a religion, who were devoted uh, to God, and they were very uh, outstanding scientists as well. Let's not go too far away. In our own community, in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, um, Dr. Abdul Salam Sahib was the first Nobel, uh, the Nobel laureate for science in um, for physics in uh, uh, among the uh, among the Muslims, and he used to say that I have deduced the th my di my discoveries are based on inspiration that I gained from the Holy Quran. And even if we go back in history, we will find that there have been many, um, many Muslim scientists and inventors who have come up with ground-breaking uh, discoveries which have almost shaped our current society. And we depend on their discoveries and their scientific progress. And they always said that we are believers in God and believers in the Holy Quran. And we gain our inspiration from that. So to say that educated people uh, shun religion and it's only the ignorant, non-educated people who follow religion, this is simply a misstatement of the facts. There is a very famous um, scholar, uh, scientist known as uh, Ibn al-Haytham. 
And he says that th there's a very famous quote, and I, I would almost say that he it developed the scientific model. And his, he used to say that something which is so in line with this scientific model that we accept today. He used to say that the seeker of truth, his duty is to be the enemy of everything and for him to doubt everything. And then for him to, him to contemplate. And whenever he goes on in this search of thinking over the cosmos or any discoveries that he's working on, he needs to keep questioning himself until there's no room for any further doubt. So th this idea that Muslims or people who follow religion or who believe in God, they believe in things blindly without rationalizing, without contemplating, this is simply untrue. I, I think it's also the concept of taqwa as well. Righteousness is also part of this, that when you do an investigation, you are fair and you do it. And un unprejudiced. Unprejudiced. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so the point that you raised, and just as Ayasa mentioned as well, the fact that most scientists we would see that don't believe in God. We have to remember that where this took place in history, if you look at the Enlightenment period, when science was advancing at a rapid rate, the only religion in the West especially was Christianity. And the problem with this, and the Promised Messiah Islam has also mentioned this, is that, that you have to believe in certain things which are, you have to believe just because they're part of faith. For example, the resurrection. You have to believe there's no scientific, there's no, uh, there's no scientific proof, there's no uh, proof in the Bible, apart from the fact that it says Jesus went up to the skies. So in the fact that at that time when science was advancing and people began to question, it was the stance of the church as well, which had, there was a tussle, and that's why we know the fact how Galileo was treated. Despite his, um, all his discoveries, he, he was quashed. And you know, uh, many of his books were not published, and even letters to his private friends, he, he still maintained till the end, in fact, that he does believe in God, but he has to question his religion. So this was a period in history where we find the fact that science versus religion began. Whereas if you look at um, Andalusia in the early age of Islam, there were scientific breakthroughs there, but most of them were Muslims or they were believers in God. So it's a, there's, there's two ways of looking at it. And so Islam doesn't really oppose scientific research? Absolutely not. As okay. we mentioned already, there's, hmm. the Quran is completely in line with it. And the fact that God and religion and the Islam itself goes in those areas where science stops. And we'll discuss this later on. Right, okay. Um, I think um, we will now just move on to uh, getting some views from the public. So uh, let's uh, go to that now. Yeah, before God exists, yeah. God, de God definitely exists, man. You know, like, as a human being, I feel like we need something like a spiritual c connection, you know? So I feel God definitely does exist. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm not in a position to, to answer. I have, like, a, my own... I have kind of a personal relationship with it, I think. Um, uh, I think... E yeah, I kind of, I kind of believe in something, but I have, um, but I think a lot of it's mediated by culture. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Does God exist? Mm. That's a difficult one. <laughs> I sort of believe he, I will say he, she. I believe something exists. Mm. At least by means which we deem necessary, scientific proof. I think it's based entirely on your belief. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, if you believe that God exists and he exists for you, it doesn't necessarily mean he exists for other people. He, she, whatever. No. 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 And uh, can you give any evidence for why you feel that God doesn't exist? Because um, there's no evidence that God exists. Um, and, yeah, um, I don't think, you know, it, to me it doesn't really make sense that, uh, uh, the world was created by one thing. Uh, yeah. yeah Me and him are both both Muslim, both raised Muslim. So yeah, we believe in God. I'd say there is. I believe that there is something out there. Yeah, and I think there is no way of proving it. I think that's that's the trick, or that's the you know that's the point. You're not supposed to really prove it. You're supposed to just believe, you know, and enjoy that. So. so um... In my opinion, I, um, when I was young, 
my uh, father and my mother uh, forced me to believe in God. But no, nowadays, uh, unfortunately, I uh, saw everything in uh, my life. And uh, I think that uh, what I'm going to do is just to, to believe in myself first and to believe in uh, the human behavior, the interpersonal relationship. I don't know, I'm quite spiritual, like I believe there is something, but like I'm not sure what. <laughs> like I go to church at Christmas, but I'm not like it's religious, but I believe in some of what the Bible says, just not all of it. I believe in God, because after so many thousands of years of scientific research, nobody can, can do what God do. I said evidence is, as you see the world, like who created it? We didn't just, we didn't just come here, you know? Someone must, have, someone must have like made me and you, you know? We can't just be alive. So there must be a higher being, you know? So yeah, a God, one God, that's my evidence, you know, I don't, there's no physical evidence, but I feel like that alone leaves a question of, you know, God's existence. I mean, it depends on how you define evidence, like uh, textual evidence, I wouldn't consider that evidence of God, it's, it's, it's more a human thing, but, so no, but I don't think that's really the point, like most, most faiths make faith the centre of it, so evidence isn't really the important part, I guess. Oh, I don't, I don't or is really, it uh, mainly based on faith that you... Yeah, I guess it's um, faith. I hope it, it exists. I hope there's more than just this life, yeah. There's a uh, hope that this is... Um, it seems a bit pointless just being born into this life and then dying and ca coming from nowhere and going to nowhere. Yeah. It's got to be... I always like the idea of a purpose. There has to be a purpose, a reason for each of us to be here. Yeah. In, does, is mankind in need for religion? I think some people are in need of it, yeah. Um, some people aren't. Sorry, I'm giving the same answer every time. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's um, fine. I think it's a personal thing. Faith is personal, belief is personal, and I think if it helps you, then, yeah. If, if you don't feel that you need it, then that's fine as well. What do you I think? can't prove it at all. Oh. In no way at all. It's something I feel here. Yeah. Um, when good things happen, I believe God's behind that. When bad things happen, I don't be, believe he's behind it, but I think he can help us find the answer. But it's just something I feel in here, not something that I can prove anyway or, or otherwise. And the thing is, like, if you want to, I feel like if you want to convince someone uh, who doesn't believe or anything, it's all, I, I feel like it's all based on faith. faith. So obviously, uh, someone who might believe in like, uh, science or whatever, like trying to disprove God or, like, or how the world is made, first of all, like, how can you believe in like, a big bang, a theory, something that just like an explosion or something that just happened and all of a sudden all these universes and everything were just created out of nowhere. So, I don't know. Uh, that's, that's my point. Uh, I'd say that's your, that's your own journey that you want to go through. I feel like that is, you know, everyone has their own belief, everyone has their own thing that they want to believe and you should stick, stick by what you feel is true. I feel, yeah, it's not my place to try and convince them of anything, but it's also whatever makes them feel comfortable that's their own thing that they have to go with, you know? That's very interesting. Um, just a reminder to the um, audience at home, you can get in touch with us via Twitter. We've already had one question, which I'll come on to shortly. But um, gentlemen, what do you think? That's a very interesting uh, set of views there. Um, there's people with, there's some sort of hope as well amongst people that there is a God as well. So what do you think? The one thing that stuck out for me when I was listening to that is one of the person saying that um, I guess it's irrelevant because um, faith is a thing which is above and beyond evidence so it doesn't really matter if there's evidence or not it's just a matter of faith and I think that's that that is something which is a distinctive feature of Islam the hallmark of Islam is that it's a religion which doesn't tell us to believe in things without any evidence it says that faith is important but the faith, we should reach that faith through our own investigative analysis and our process of thinking and contemplation. And when we think about that from, from that aspect, when we look at God, we will always find evidence that he exists. We've mentioned some of those things. For example, just the fact that 
I mean, testimonial evidence is a great form of evidence for thousands of prophets who claim that they are prophets, who made these prophecies, prophecies that were fulfilled, for them to come at different times in different parts of the world and make the same claim that there is a God who exists and he has given me this message and I've come. That is something that we should accept because, I mean, we do this in our normal, in our normal lives as well. We listen and believe in so many things without having firsthand investigated those things ourselves. For example, I always say in, in almost as a joke, but it's true. How many of us have actually, when did we ever ask our mothers that they should produce proof that we are the sons or daughters of our fathers? We accept that a person is our father merely on the, and we go through our whole lives accepting this one man as being our father because our mother said so. So that's a form of testimonial evidence. Atheists never say that I will only believe in the authenticity of my father being my father when I'm produced with evidence, uh, with genetic DNA evidence. That's not true. Because the human fabric naturally is something which promotes trust. We trust each other and we accept people who are known to be honest. So when prophets of God who are known in society as being honest, when they all make these claims, how can we just automatically reject them? It was, it was interesting response. I've actually got a um, thing that stuck with me. First of all, I was surprised, actually. I thought there may have been more people who say they don't believe in God, especially given all the, the research polls, etc. But, well, they, there you go. There's still some hope. But in the fact that there's one gentleman that mentioned that there was, um, if there was, he, he would like to think there was something afterwards. And that's very important, uh, as in, it's not that you start with nothing and you go to nothing. It's a very interesting concept. There's hope, in, there's hope in the fact that it's a natural inclination that you yes. should have a purpose in life. Yes. Otherwise, if you think about it, then your, your purpose in life is just to eat, to go to work, to come home, do whatever you, know, you fancy kind of thing, or do it because someone else tells you. Or it, you don't have a purpose. The fact that Islam tells you that it gives you that purpose of life, that mankind has been created. And, and what, what is the purpose of life? As, as uh, the Quran mentions, that mankind has been created to worship God. As in, that's one of our purposes in life. And another point that we could mention, linking into this, is just that if, if God has set this purpose out for us and not shown us the way in the, in the fact that through prophets and through the promise of Messiah in this age, how would we ever fulfill that purpose? So that's another point. And the fact that at the end of the day, Osman Sab, if you think about it, a person who believes never misses out. He's always in, in the better. For example, if, if let's for example, for argument's sake, say that there is no God, there is no afterlife. So that's fine. Uh, at the end of the day, we'll all finish. Mm. A, a, an atheist and a believer will both finish. But if in this day and age, and we know through various signs that there is an afterlife and you will be uh, punished or rewarded according to your deeds, then compare an atheist with a believer. Who has a better chance of? It's you know, better to be a good it's person to be, and live your life in. It's such better a way. to be a believer than yes. an atheist. You're right, better right. off. No, in not to way. say that atheists aren't good people, because yeah. you can be, you can do good things and follow things of morality without believing in God. But the point is that when there is a God who exists, then why should we not accept Him? That's that's the right. point, right? Okay. We do have another guest uh, on the line. We have Dr. Atau Rahman Masab. Um, uh, Dr. Sab, are you on the line? Assalamualaikum, yes. Welcome, Salam. How are you? Dracula, very well. I think with uh, uh, interest and uh, fascinating discussions you guys have been having. Okay. Um, Masab, I wanted to ask you, people argue that as science progresses, ultimately God will be taken out of the equation. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> I would respectfully completely disagree with that notion. I actually think that the more scientific knowledge we gain, the closer we will get to God. Uh, you know, the, we were talking about um, the DNA evidence, etc. I also was talking about it. Uh, there's a you know, three billion letter long genetic code on the DNA. As we learn more about it, we realized that that code was actually purposely fully written with all sorts of information and sequences present within that code. Today's generation will, of course, understand uh, the computer codes, all those zeros and all those ones that, um, you know, transmit all that data. And, you know, you, you need a program.
programmer for that. If you say that that could have been done without a programmer, well, then maybe we can have a conversation. But, you know, uh, the fact that this could not have been done without a, uh, a creator, a programmer, I think proves to me that God will always remain relevant and that God will always be a part of the equation. I think over the coming decades and centuries, the recognition of more and more um, prowesses of God will be realized and the world of science will come closer to the world of religion and closer to God, inshallah ta'ala. That's very interesting. Uh, thank you very much for your um, contribution there, Dr. Mwasa. Um Gentlemen, uh, there's a question from Twitter. It's going back to uh, the earlier conversation that we had. And um, uh, the question is, Karl Marx's teachings spread to the corners of the earth. He had and has millions of followers. How is this different from the message of a prophet getting to the corners of the earth? Marx never believed in God. So what do you guys think of that? I think it comes back to this concept of revelation and prophecy. Karl Marx does not have um, a history of making prophecies, uh, magnificent prophecies that were fulfilled in letter and spirit, but the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did, and those prophecies were fulfilled. Um, and that's what differentiates someone from a normal, ordinary person who's who has followers and his teachings spread to the ends of the earth. The, the spreading of a teaching to the ends of the earth in itself is not the evidence for God. The evidence for God comes from the fact that the person whose teachings spread to the ends of the earth, he has a living connection with God and he makes prophecies. And he says that I make this prophecy on the behest of God. God who speaks to me, he has revealed to me that at such and such time, this and this such and such event will take place. And then when that event takes place, sometimes in his lifetime, sometimes many years after the death of that prophet, that is a testimonial, a, a, that is a seal which demonstrates that that person was from God. Because then either you have to accept that that person is God, because he made a prophecy which is above and beyond human capacity, or you accept that there is a God who is behind him who made those prophecies and gave him that knowledge of the unseen. Prophecy and revelation and Absolutely. the fulfillment of those is the evidence of yeah. uh, yeah. such a person. Interesting also, as well, so if we, it's inadvertently connected to Karl Marx as well. If we study the promise of Sire's life, there was a grand prophecy about World War I, and um, in which the promise of Sire Islam said that God Almighty told me that a great calamity will befall the world. And he mentioned Zalzal al Sa'a, which is like the calamity resembling the day of judgment, something of that grand scale, where there will be bloodshed throughout the world, etc. Et there were many, many aspects to this prophecy. And one of those prophecy, the points in the prophecy was that the Tsar at that time, who was the, the leader the of, Russia, of Russia, at the time, would yeah. be, when, that, when this calamity befalls, will be in a pitiful state. So for, interestingly enough, if we think about it, this prophecy was in 1905. And if you think about it, in 1905, despite all the wars, uh, the small colonial wars that were going on, the Tsar of Russia, it is said, and it's, uh, you can go online and search this up as well, his wealth is said to have been approximately, given the inflation, et cetera, calculated, to about $300 billion. Mm. So the Tsar of Russia was not a small person. He was one of the most powerful men on that in the earth. Yes. And it said approximately the fifth richest man in history. So if we think about it, the promise of Sayyid Islam sitting in Gardian, an unknown place for the world at that time, makes this prophecy that the Tsar will be in a pitiful state when this calamity befalls. Yes. And that happens to be you know, fulfilled within. And interestingly, in this prophecy, the promise of Sayyid says that God Almighty may de defer this prophecy, and I'm paraphrasing. But within 16 years, this will be fulfilled. Yeah, so it was at the, uh, uh, towards the end of World War I, 1917, is when, the, when, when the, the revolution was given, happened. Exactly. Uh, suffered very badly. So, I, I just want to move on the conversation slightly because we're running uh, close to the end of time. The subject of suffering, that I think is quite important and something that people often uh, raise a question on is that if God exists, then why do so many bad things happen? So, uh, yes, sir. The question is, um, okay, Let's take God out of the, the, the let's take, the, this question basically bases its premise on the fact that the reason there is suffering, therefore God does not exist. Because if God existed, they were be, there would be no suffering, which is a flawed premise. Because let's take God out of the equation. And now I will ask the question that if we take God out of the equation, 
as atheists have taken God out of the equation, does suffering cease to exist? And the answer is no. So if suffering is going to exist with or without God in the equation, then that proves that the two things are mutually exclusive. They don't have anything to do with it. You can't say that because there is suffering, therefore God doesn't exist. There are reasons for suffering. Much of the suffering that we see in the world today is man-made because the richer nations deprive the poorer nations from food, from resources, from other things, and that's why they suffer. There's other reasons as well for suffering. There, the thing is, unless and until each and every human being on this earth is a robot made out of metal with the same components, with the same capacities, there will be suffering because when you have a difference or diversity in creation, there are certain people who are more intelligent than others. There are certain people who are more well-off than others. There are certain people who um, have a better life in general. That's because of the circumstances that surround their individual lives. So th that cannot be used as a proof to ex establish that God doesn't exist. I mean, some suffering is a relative thing too. I always joke and say that sometimes even leaving the house without our iPhone or an iPad becomes a huge issue. Whereas 50 years ago, there was no conception of these things. So as we grow closer and closer to a life of comfort, we, we begin to suffer more as well. That, that's another thing as well. And Zafar um, this is a key question um, that we need to, I think, answer for the audience as well, is communication with God. I mean, this is essential, I think, in order to prove the existence of God. How can we communicate with him and how do we achieve that? Well, as followers of the Promised Messiah, Islam, he's laid it out for us clearly, easily, explaining the teachings of the Holy Prophet وسلم, and the teachings of the Holy Quran, and even in his books, and throughout the fact that the key to forming a, a connection with God is following the teachings of Islam and following the teachings of the Holy Quran. Even the Quran itself, it states that when my servants ask about me, tell them I am near. And I answer the prayer of the supplicant when he prays to me. So remember, Sahib, the key here, the clause, is when he prays to me. So you can't expect to be walking around and suddenly God to start communicating with you. There has to be some sort of uh, approach, some sort of s struggle in itself. Nothing is given to you on a plate, even in this world, to achieve anything. You have to work hard for it. And the Quran even says that those who strive in our paths, we will grant them that guidance. And we will grant them or show them the way that will lead to our paths. And the fact is, it's all through a personal connection with God. And the fact that one prays in how capacity there is, and God will eventually lead you to Islam and to the Holy Quran. And in this day and age, only the community of the Promised Messiah of Islam will be able to say that God still speaks. Ask any of the other Muslims. No one believes in the fact that God still speaks today. And the reason why we still are attached to this is through the living rope. And that living rope is the institution of Khilafat. And the fact that we see from day one to now, in 120 odd years, through each of the caliphates through each of the leaders of the Ahmadiyya community, we've seen extreme advances in the fact that every year there are people who accept Ahmadiyya, who see signs, who see the truth and are attached. And they're all bound, we're all bound together by one institute and that's the institution of Khilafat. Okay, Zakallah, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, both of, uh, uh, both Zafid Malik Sahib and Yasmin Mutsab, thank you. And also to th thank you to Dr. Atau Rahman Mahsab, who joined us on the telephone. Um, so um, please do get in touch with us um, if you have any further comments or any further questions via email or Twitter. Uh, we, would, uh, we would look forward to receiving uh, su uh, such comments from you. Um, just to announce next week's uh, subject. Uh, we're going to be talking about do we need religion? So again, this is uh, something quite pertinent and something that I think a lot of youngsters especially uh, are quite interested in as well. So, um, so once again, I'd like to thank uh, my studio guests uh, and also thank you to the viewers as well for joining us this week. Um, please do join us again next Sunday at the same time. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. صداقتیں اسلام کچھ بھی ہو جائیں گے ہم جہاں بھی کے جا
जाना पड़े हमें जान